Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vince McCoy. I'm uh, one of the several consultants from WIT that uh, you see walking about in these fine and fancy blue shirts. Um, I want to give a shout out to my colleagues because this whole session doesn't work without them. And we really appreciate all your assistance all day long. This is actually our fifth year of hosting this summit. Uh, we had over 300 attendees this year. So we're pretty proud of that and hope that with your continued engagement and involvement, uh, we can continue to offer this BI summit for this area, this region of this year. And every year, we were really fortunate to have a lot of great sponsorship support and be able to bring in uh, great speakers. And that's my role at this time, not to be a great speaker, but to introduce one of the best. Um, much like Saturday Night Live, Donald Farmer is a repeat attendee at this <laughs> for us. Um, he's a familiar face that is now back for the third time to give a keynote address. Uh, he's a principal with the Tree Hives, uh, as a principal of Tree Hive Strategy, uh, he's really an internationally respected thinker in the fields in which we work, of data analysis, with over 30 years of practical experience. Um, so on his 31st birthday, he's here today. <laughs> uh, he's worked hard in award-winning startups in the UK and in Iceland, uh, 15 years of experience with Microsoft and Click. Uh, leading teams designing and developing new capabilities in data integration, in data mining, self-service analytics, and visualization. So I think you're all in for a treat. Um, great conversationalist, wonderful thinker. Let's hear it for Mr. Donald Farmer. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Well, it's, uh, thank you very much for hanging around so long. It's, it's my job today is to keep you here right until rush hour um, <laughs> and to time it perfectly for your journey home. Um, I'm speaking today on, on a subject that's very dear to my heart, um, which is governance and compliance. Um, I'm not very compliant, but um, I like the, the idea of this subject because when I've worked for many years um, in traditional IT-led industries. I've worked on data warehouses in the oil industry and, and the whiskey industry, all, Scot all Scotland's kind of national fluids. And um, the great thing about those industries is they're very highly regulated. So you learn a lot about the necessity of carefully governing systems. But then you come into the world of self-service, and I worked at uh, Microsoft building tools like Power Pivot, and I worked at Click building tools like, like, like ClickSense, and um, you're now in a completely different world where the business user has even more control. And so these two worlds come together. How can you govern a business where business users are e effectively choosing their own technologies? And so the first thing I kind of want to talk about is this new reality of this world. And what is the new reality that we face? Um, let me just sum it up in a very simple way. We now have, the new reality is this, we now have better technology at home than we do in the office. Every time you come into the office, swipe your card, log on to the system, you've downgraded. It doesn't matter where you work. It was true when I worked at Microsoft. I, I'll give you an example of that. When I worked at Microsoft, um, I, I led one of the data mining teams. And um, so data mining at Microsoft was at part of SQL Server. You know, we were developing cutting edge data mining products. If we wanted to get a new server, however, in order to you know, run new data mining algorithms on or do some testing, and maybe we wanted something crazy like, oh, a terabyte of storage. You know, we had to go out and requisition that. We had to get it supplied. We had to get a new server installed in the, in the server room. Techs had to come along and install this. And this was, this was work. Sometimes we had to go and beg, borrow, and steal servers from companies like Unisys and HP and please give us a server because we want to do more data mining. And today I work at home and I work from my home office and I have more than 14 um, technologies that I connect to to do data mining. I can connect to TensorFlow, I can connect to all sorts of Amazon services to do it, I can connect to Microsoft Azure services. I've got complete control. I have 14 different data mining engines that I can access at any time. As for a terabyte of storage, well, you know, nowadays that's a USB drive or I've got it on the cloud and I don't need to worry about it. 
So this is the new reality. You have better technology at home than you do in the office, and you always will have now, because in your office, you have to pay for it in a different way. In your office, your IT department has to requisition material equipment and have it paid for by the finance department, who then have to amortize it over a number of years. The accountants control the life cycle of your equipment. If you want a new laptop at home, you go buy a new laptop at home. You upgrade it every year if you want. If, you're, if you've got a new phone, you can upgrade that on, on the right plan. It still costs money, but there's nobody telling you you can or cannot do it. So you have no excuse not to have the best technology at home. In the office, you're on a completely different life cycle, and that changes the way in which you use those technologies. So users now have a new type of power that they never had before. Um, the user's environment is simple, and the IT environment is incredibly complex. Now, when I say the user's environment is simple, um, I'll take that example of storage, a terabyte of storage for my server. If I want a terabyte of storage now, I, just can, I can go into Dropbox, I can go into Box, I can go into almost anywhere. I can go into Click Cloud and provision myself with an entire cloud system for doing business intelligence and analytics. I can upload my data there. I can collaborate with people on it. I never need to tell the IT department what I'm doing. I can just go online and immediately I've got data. I can get data from Data Market. I can and install dashboards. I can share. And it's all there. There's no provisioning for me to do. Now, that makes my life as a business user incredibly simple. The IT's world now becomes incredibly complex because they're trying to manage all these systems at the same time. You don't know. You, I, I can absolutely guarantee if you're an IT administrator today, you do not know what platforms you will be supporting in three years' time. You may think you do. You may even have a three-year plan. Good luck with that. Uh, you have no idea. Um, I can't even tell you. Um, I've got friends who, who work in the, the, the hardware design business. They can't tell you what platforms are going to be in three years. They don't know what the screen resolutions are going to be. They don't know what the hardware, um, the storage solutions are going to be. They don't know what the speed of the hardware is going to be. They know it's going to be better, faster, bigger, more expensive, more fun, but they don't know what it's going to be. And so the business user has this very, very simple world where they can just go out and provision themselves with anything. And the IT of a highly complex world are trying to make sense of all this and trying to somehow keep some kind of control of it and, and pity the poor IT department that, that have to do that. And the interesting thing is that it's not just about bring your own device anymore. It's bring your own data. It's bring your own app into this environment. It's all very well. You can go out and buy iOS and Android devices and you know, um, Nokia devices, whatever it is you want to work on. Um, but you can also go out and provision the example I gave you. You can go out and provision storage on Dropbox. Now, when I worked at, at um, a very kind of innovative technology company, uh, we had a very strict rule, which was, you know, you share documents internally on SharePoint. Yeah, right. We just put them on Dropbox. We had shared Evernote where we put information because that was an easier way of doing it, working than putting things on SharePoint. And you know something, our company wouldn't support us in doing that. So we just went out and paid for the licenses ourselves. It didn't cost us very much. It was like 50 bucks a year or something for the storage that we needed. We didn't even bother expensing it. That's how easy it was for us to provision our own apps. And then when it comes to provisioning your own data, well, now you can go out to all sorts of services like data.gov and data market. You can go out to Bitly and get access to numerous data support sources from all around the world if you want to incorporate that data into your analysis. You want demographic data because you're doing research and marketing for a particular region, go online, download it, you've got instant access to demographic data that you can incorporate into your, into your analysis. So you can bring your own devices, your own data, your own apps. It's a tremendously exciting world if you're a business user. And then the worry is, well, how do you make sense of all that? How do, how do how, are, are our business users really trained in doing this? How many of our business users have actually been on training course in order to, to use the tools that, they, that they're using? They can just go on and you know, download an app and get started with it. How do they know they're doing a good job? And there's two answers to this. One is to take the, what you might call the provisioning approach, which is we will provide training, we'll provide apps, we'll provide training. I think that's actually very valuable. But um, literacy it doesn't quite work that way. Literacy actually works by people learning, if you like, on the job. They learn in their daily lives. When you learn to read, of course, you went to school and you were sat down and you, and you were educated in reading. And, you know, especially if you had to learn to read English, it's actually not a very easy language to, to, to read. All those kind of weird letter combinations and pronunciations. Um, 
So you learn to read and write, and it's, 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 a, it's a tough job. But that's not how you become literate. It's not the learning that's part of literacy. How you become literate is by practicing. My mother still remembers that the very first thing I read and read aloud was actually the, the side of a biscuit tin. And I started reading all the ingredients and the descriptions of all the cookies. And that was my kind of breakthrough in reading. I can read something. I can read a real thing, not just a sentence on the blackboard, but, but real world. Data literacy is a bit like that. You work with data. You can go in training courses. You can go on you know, courses online. You can go in courses organized by your business. But using data, having conversations about data, is how you become data literate. Um, it, the example I've got on screen, a RunKeeper, it's an application that runs on your iPhone or on your Android. You can put it in your pocket. You can go for a run, and it measures your, your pace and your, your, your speed. It measures the elevation that you're running at because it has the GPS coordinates. And it can give you a screen where you have a map of all the runs that you've done. On the left-hand side, you've got a history. Along the top, you've got KPIs, like your averages and your totals of things that you've done. If I had come to you even five, six years ago and said, I can give you a dashboard. It's going to give you all your corporate data with a geospatial um, visualization of that data laid out. It's going to have history on the left-hand side that you can browse. It's going to have all your up-to-date KPIs on the top. It runs on any device. It'll run in your desktop. It'll run on any mobile device that you've got. And you'd have said, wow, you know, how much is that going to cost me? That's a, that's a serious bit of, of business intelligence there. Well, it's not. It's 99 cents in the App Store. That's, that's the world we're living in today. And, and you're data literate because that's, you, don't need a, you don't want a training course to learn how to use RunKeeper. If you, if you had to learn how to use it, it wouldn't, ironically, it wouldn't be worth 99 cents. It's the very fact that it's so cheap and so accessible means it has to be easier to use. We used to call this at Microsoft the washing machine repairman problem. Um, if you have a problem with your washing machine and the Maytag guy turns up, he turns up with a huge big toolkit. And that toolkit has got all sorts of things in there, all sorts of wrenches and screwdrivers and parts and things like that. He uses a 10 millimeter wrench. He uses an electric meter. He uses a screwdriver of a standard size. But if he, if he turned up with a 10 millimeter wrench, an electric meter, and a screwdriver, you wouldn't pay him. And you wouldn't want Maytag servicing your equipment. Um, the simpler something is, the easier it is, the less professional it feels. But actually, if you look around your world of data literacy, you're doing real data work in your everyday life when you look at your fantasy sports numbers, when you look at your smart meters in the house, if you've got a hybrid and you look at the, the performance metrics on your hybrid, all of these things are in teaching you. They're, you're, you're breathing it in, data literacy in your daily in your daily work. And then there's some tricks and there's some problems that you can run into it. People say, yeah, but how are people going to be trained in problems like what I show on the bottom right hand side? These are interest rates between 2008 and 2012, but they're shown with different axes. And one of the axes makes it look as if the interest rates are flat. They, they hardly vary at all between 3.2% and 3.3% or 3.1% and 3.2%. So it looks completely flat. The other axis makes it look as if they're rising rapidly, but they're still rising between 3.14% and 3.15%. So which of these is correct? Is one of these misleading? Well, actually, they're both absolutely correct, and neither of them is misleading. It depends on the context in which you're going to use them. If you are thinking of in, back in um, 2012 of taking out a car loan, of taking out a mortgage, it's actually really good to know that the rates have been pretty much flat for the last five years and are not going anywhere anytime soon. That's useful information. So having the flat line is actually very appropriate for that need. If, on the other hand, you work in a brokerage and you're, you know, you're working with hundreds of millions of dollars of loans and you're, you're working on the margins of those loans and you're buying and selling them and arbitraging them, then knowing that there is a constant increase over the last five years, even though it has been very small, but it's been fairly dramatic in those terms, is actually quite useful. I can now arbitrage a few $10 million loans and make some money on it because the interest rate is ticking up all the time. That's also useful information. If I turned around to you and said, no, nothing's happening in interest rates, it's flat, then you'd have missed that opportunity for arbitrage. So the context is what teaches you um, the best example to use. And I can't go out and tell you in some kind of a priori way, which is going to be the best visualization. But that's also something that you learn through literacy. So that's the one side. 
That's the, re that's the reality that we face. Um, our world is becoming more and more complex for IT, but it's becoming very simple for business users. And business users are becoming literate in the tools they're using. They are capable of doing remarkable things with data simply because they're learning those, those, those skills, those data literacy skills in their everyday lives and bringing those into business. And they're bringing the applications and devices and the data that they use into business as well. And that's a dramatic change from the world of even five or six years ago. But there's another side to this. There are increasing de demands of governance and compliance. And when I say demands, you know, I've, I've been thinking a lot recently, uh, you'll tell from my accent that I'm Scottish, so I've been thinking recently about the European Union and Brexit and all these things, but there's a European regulation coming in in May about data privacy and the rules that you have to mark around data privacy. And those rules say that if you have a data breach in Europe from the end of May onwards, you could be liable for up to 5% of your global annual turnover in fines. 5% of your global annual turnover. That is billions of dollars in fines for a data breach. That's a, that's a serious commitment to, to governance, and that puts serious demands on every business. Um, almost any business that does anything with customer data, any business over about 20 employees, will need to have a data privacy officer full-time with the skills and insight and the tools and the support to make sure that data is held privately and securely. And that's only one legislation, that's only one jurisdiction. These rules are coming in absolutely everywhere. And if it's not even rules, it's just things like public reputation. It actually turns out that no matter how, how eye-watering these fines are, companies are much more worried about their public reputation when it comes to data privacy and security. So these increasing demands for governance are coming in at exactly the same time as the business users are getting more and more empowered to do whatever they want with the data. And that's the challenge, is how do you bring these two things together? There are four aspects of this that I want to just describe very quickly. Um, and I, I spent, you know, I, I do a whole day training course on these subjects and very often we'll spend several hours um, covering these topics to ensure that in any organization there's a good understanding of what these, these different elements are. So I'm going to give you a high level overview but it's important to understand that there are four different aspects to um, these issues. There's the governance and compliance, which are really two sides of the same coin. We'll talk a little bit about the differences and similarities. And then there's security and privacy. Now, these four things are not the same. And we use the same words very often, very, very close conjunction to each other. It's very easy to get muddled up. And so one of the things I like to do is to sit down with a, a company and simply, as we work through their strategy, sit down and actually clarify what these things mean in your context. But today we'll talk about it at a higher level, hopefully give you an understanding that at least you can take back to your companies and start to have those conversations. And the first conversation is, what's the difference between security and privacy for us? And security and privacy, the examples I give on screen, the little icons, I think will hopefully help to, to describe that. Security is about making sure the right people and only the right people get into your system. It's the lock on the door. And privacy is about making sure that people don't see what they shouldn't see. It's the curtains that prevent people looking in. So you can have privacy, you can draw the curtains, but if you don't lock the door, you're not secure. On the other hand, you can be secure and not private. People could have logins to your system, but if you've got no internal controls over what these people can see, they could legitimately log in and see everything. I have seen the systems which have struggled with provisioning data and have come up with the simple and effective solution of making everyone an administrator. Hey, it works, you know, everybody can see everything and I don't have any of these problems of people not being able to log into their dashboards. I've seen people solve problems of provisioning data for CEOs and CFOs by making these senior officers administrators in, in, in the system. Now, why do they do that? Because it's so difficult to provision in certain database systems that, hey, you know, the CFO should have permission to see everything. Surely the CEO can see everything. I'll make them an administrator. And then the CEO ends up deleting something because they don't know how to run the system and chaos ensues. So there's a difference between security and privacy that's important to understand. Um, and that difference is, is going to be, as I say, different for every organization. What are the privacy concerns in your organization? What are the security concerns? But you have to separate them in order to be able to model this properly. 
The other set of concerns is the difference between governance and compliance. Now, compliance is, is pretty straightforward. It's the checkboxes that say there is a set of rules that we are compliant with. There's a set of rules that we live up to. And those rules may be internal, they may be external, they may be internal and external, and there may be many sets of them. Um, but for, to give you an example, there are compliance rules around state legislation about employing in minorities and sexual harassment training and things like that. And, and if you're in um, maybe the financial side of your business, you may have ethics training that you have to do. And very often these rules are little more than checkboxes. Yes, everybody's done their ethics training, therefore we're ethical. And you can go through that and check all the boxes. And you might not be ethical, but you're compliant. Thank goodness. Um, governance is a little bit different. Governance is the side of making sure that, well, actually you are ethical in real life, that bad things don't happen to your system. You can be compliant without governance, but it's really difficult because most compliance rules will imply a certain amount of, of, of governance um, that's required. But you can be well governed without being compliant without anything because you don't happen to match that set of rules. And so you, again, in your industry, and in your departments and in your specific use cases, you have to be clear about what the difference is between governance and compliance. And so then you can put these four things back together again and realize that there are privacy concerns that affect compliance and governance. There are security concerns which affect, affect privacy. There are security concerns which affect compliance. And these things don't necessarily all relate to each other. They have to be carefully modeled separately and understood separately. But that's actually one of the first steps to getting this right in your organization. Understanding the difference between security and privacy and governance and compliance. And once you've done that, then you can start to take some, some steps towards creating an action plan towards, towards making this work. However, I have some real problems with all these approaches. And the problem is this. I made it very clear at the beginning that we're actually living in a new world. We're not living in the world that we lived in back in you know, 99, 98, when I was working on you know, large-scale data warehouses for the whiskey industry and, and the oil industry. At that time, very, very few people even had a laptop at home, never mind a mobile device that could connect to any network. And so the rules and processes that, that we built around data security and compliance and regulation were really very different, and they just don't work in today's world. And the biggest mistake you can make is thinking that you can take the way in which you used to work and apply it to the new world. Because the technology has moved on so quickly that trying to apply old regulations and old rules simply doesn't work anymore. There's an example I can give you. Let's think, I mean, is there an example I could find of that that would be relevant to the city of Detroit? Well, how about the self-driving car? Um, the self-driving car is going to disrupt tremendous number of businesses around here, the autonomous vehicle. And the autonomous vehicle is actually really interesting to me as a technology in a number of ways. First of all, it's kind of cool. I've seen self-driving buses and trucks in Sweden at, at, at Volvo headquarters. I've seen um, self-driving cars down at, at Google, down at Mountain View in California. I've seen them driving along the freeway. I've seen some self-driving Ubers. I have a Tesla with autopilot. I always keep my hands on the wheel, I promise. And, um, but it's a remarkable technology and, and really does work tremendously well. So those things are kind of cool and very interesting. But there's, there's other things that bother me about the self-driving car. And it, I realized that I, I was VP of innovation at Click, and I realized that it's not very innovative. I mean, it's innovative in terms of the technology that makes it drive, but why does it look like a car? It doesn't need to. It doesn't need to look like a car anymore. It could look like anything. It could look like a spaceship. It could look like a bird. It could be anything. And yet we make it car-shaped. Why do we make it car-shaped? Because that's what a car is. And then you start to think about regulations. There was a case um, just at the weekend. Um, somebody came through a junction and T-boned a self-driving Uber in Arizona. And uh, the problem there was that you know, the driver didn't, the, the, the human driver driving the other car didn't obey the red light and drove through a red light and crashed into the, in, into the Uber. The Uber wasn't at fault. It was absolutely fine. The self-driving technology actually worked, but somebody drove into the side of it. I had a friend who um, 
He moved from Microsoft in Egypt to Microsoft in Seattle, and he'd been driving in Egypt for about 10 years. If you've ever driven in Egypt, it is just a nightmare. It is the worst traffic in the world. He had never had an accident. He was very proud of that until the first day he drove in Seattle, and he made a fatal mistake. Well, not a fatal mistake, but he made a serious mistake. He stopped at a red light. <laughs> and it turns out that really in Egypt, you don't do that. Um, people just ran into the back of him. So he learned that lesson, and three days later, he had another accident because he did the other very Egyptian thing was he stopped at a green light. And why did he stop at a green light? Well, because somebody might actually be coming the other way and, and going through the junction. And so now he had two crashes in two weeks because he was obeying the rules as far as he could, as, as he could tell. And so here's an interesting thing about the self-driving car. One of the challenges with the self-driving car is making sure it recognizes red lights. Now, the Tesla's actually pretty good at it, but isn't that weird? In a world where we all had self-driving cars, you wouldn't need red lights. The cars would be able to negotiate their way through the junctions anyway. The red lights are there because we are terrible drivers, not because the Tesla is a terrible driver. And so taking the rules and regulations of how a self-driving car works and applying our rules and regulations to them is actually kind of missing the point of the technology in many ways. Now, of course, they're going to have co cohabit for many years. But my point is the same, that we're regulating a new technology with the mindset of the old technology is never going to work. Now, this has been a problem in Detroit for many, many years, since 1896, when Henry Ford took advantage of local carriage building industry to build his first automobile. And in those days, there was a real problem, which was, we didn't call them automobiles, he called them the horseless carriage. It was a carriage without a horse. And certain problems if you've got a carriage without a horse. First of all, you know, who's going to control it? So in the UK, I actually don't know if they did this in America, but in the UK, they made it a law that you could drive a car anywhere so long as there was a man walking in front of it holding a flag. And that then controlled the car because it could never go any faster than the guy holding the flag. You hope, especially if you're the guy holding the flag. So, um, so they have this very simple rule that managed the system. Perfect. In America, far more advanced technology. The worry here wasn't so much going too fast, but it might frighten old ladies and children and horses to see this thing rolling down the street with no horse. So Americans, being much more inventive than the, U than the British, didn't have a man with a flag. They invented the horsey horseless, which was a rubber horse that you rubber horse's head that you stuck in the front of your horseless carriage to make it look as if you had a horse. And in this way, old ladies and children and horses would not be frightened as, as these crazy vehicles careered through the streets. But what they're trying to do, of course, and you've never seen a horsey horseless. It's not like I can go out and buy one from my Tesla. It would be kind of cool if I could buy one from my Tesla, but uh, you can't do that. Um, and why? It's because old ladies and children and horses very quickly adapted to the new technology. The new technology was so good, it was so efficient, that there was no need to you know, kind of manage it with the old regulations, what you had to do was find a new way of living with it. And so we introduced things like red lights, which we didn't have when we had horses, because horses have more sense. And um, this new technology is governed by the new regulations which match the technology. Now, all this big analogy is a way of saying, really, that this new world of business and IT working together has got to be governed by a new set of rules, but more importantly, by a new mindset. Think of application lifecycle management, this classic kind of way of, of managing your system. And we've all been through this if we've done kind of IT training or we've, or we've worked in IT processes. And lifecycle management generally starts with gathering requirements. You gather requirements, you sit down and you design a product or solution, you develop that product or solution, you test, I hope you test it, you test it, you put it into deployment, and then the whole cycle starts again. You start taking more requirements, you start taking feedback, you go back into that cycle. But the world we're living in isn't like that. So you start off with a new system and you say, okay, I've got my requirements and the system's gonna be deployed next year, it's gonna take us like a year to build it. And by the way, Andy Bitter, a German analyst who used to work with Gartner, once pointed out that data warehouse projects see a churn of about 40% of their requirements every year. 40% of the core requirements of a data warehouse will change every year. The average data warehouse project takes 18 months to deploy. You can see the problem. By the time you deploy your data warehouse, it's 60% out of date. Um, and this is what happens with lifecycle automation. 
you know, you start deploying from, oh yeah, we're going to deploy, we've decided to deploy on the iPad. That's great, things move along. People say, well, actually our business users are no longer deploying on the iPad, they'd really like to use the Galaxy Note 7. Okay, we'll deploy in the Galaxy Note 7, what could go wrong? Well, it literally blows up. <laughs> And the next thing you know is, oh, well, let's go back, but we're not going to go back to the iPad. Let's take the Microsoft Surface. And then the next thing you know is the Galaxy 8 comes out and everything is good again. And the requirements are churning so much. And they say, okay, well, we'll design for one platform. We'll go back to just a multi-device platform. It'll, it'll be completely device neutral. We'll do it with HTML5. But then it turns out people really want access to the camera and the geospatial, and they want to be able to connect it to their drone in some way. And before you know it, the requirements have changed again. And these requirements aren't changing from the IT department. When my son first joined his company, you know, he, um, like, every, like every kid, you know, going into a company, the first thing he wanted to do was connect his Android phone to the network so he could do email on his phone. And they said, well, you can't do email on your phone. Are you crazy? No, you, you, we'll give you a BlackBerry, and that's the only thing you're allowed to connect to our network. And he said, but I, I want to use an Android. Everybody uses an Android. He said, no, you, you must, use an, uh, must use a BlackBerry. Well, that all changed. And it all changed very, I mean, I can tell you exactly when it changed. Actually, it changed in January the 4th, 2010. And why did it change in January the 4th, 2010? And why am I so sure of that date? Because it was the first Monday after the Christmas holidays, and the CEO got an iPad for his Christmas. And so when the CEO came in at the beginning of January with his iPad and says, I want to do my email on the iPad, the IT department didn't turn around and say, you can't connect that to our network. They went out and made it possible to connect devices to the network. And all their plans for mobile device deployment had to be thrown out because things had changed overnight. So that's how application lifecycle management breaks out and down. The requirements are changing just too rapidly. Look at other, pro this is a great example of how to solve it. There was a process called CRISP-DM. Anybody, anybody heard of CRISP-DM? Yeah, some, some data miners. If you're a data miner and you're into predictive analytics, you literally know what's going to come next. But the, um, the sorry, that was a joke. That was terrible. Um, but the point about CRISP-DM was that it was a life cycle model for data mining. But they faced exactly the same problem. Requirements are changing too quickly. Deployment models are changing too quickly. So they came up with a radically simpler model which made this more manageable. And here it is. And um, IBM now introduced a new life cycle model, which consists of two apparently infinitely connected life cycles. I can't even read this diagram without getting a headache. And, um, but that's the answer to let's, let's try and build all these processes into a bigger, more complex process. But that's not what's happening. What's happening is processes are breaking down. Well, there's another way of doing it, which is, well, let's adopt Agile, in which case we'll have lots of little lifecycle management processes running. But then that has the same problem, that they, they break down too quickly. The challenge here is that IT departments actually don't know if they are leading their users into a new set of requirements by being the technology experts that can lead the users on, or are they following as quickly as they can, rapidly trying to keep up with user requirements. If you haven't got that sorted out in your head, you end up in this kind of situation where, you know, what direction are we going in? It looks as if every possible scenario was blocked off. And if you don't know if you're leading and following, you end up in an even worse situation um, where you, you know, you don't know what order you're doing things in. And this is a, actually a critical problem for IT is that they literally don't know if they are leading or following user requirements in the business. And you've really got to get that sorted out. And this comes from trying to manage your environment with a traditional set of models in a world where these models are simply not relevant anymore. So what is the IT department's role? Well, the IT department's role may be to provision. And the other concern, of course, comes back to governance and compliance. The IT department's role is to keep bad actors out of the system. Now, bad actors, I don't mean Bruce, Bruce Willis. I mean, you know, people who have bad intentions, people who come into the system, maybe um, hackers, but not just hackers, people who already have legitimate logins to your system, but are using the system for nefarious ends or are using it in, in, in some way that might not be either governable or compliant. And so the IT department absolutely have that as a, as, a, as, a, as a rule. Even if we're not providing all the devices, even if we're not providing all the data, even if we're not providing all the apps, we still have the responsibility of keeping bad actors out of the system. And that is a real challenge because, well, I can't resist Bruce Willis. Let's talk about him. So um, 
And Bruce Willis is actually the key to this problem. <laughs> Seriously. Um, those of you who have seen Die Hard, and Die Hard, of course, is the great holiday movie. This tells you a lot about, you know, when I was a kid, the great holiday movie was Sound of Music. Now it's Die Hard. That's a, that alone is a paradigm shift for me. But um, the interesting thing about Die Hard is it's set in Nakatomi Plaza. And Nakatomi Plaza, actually Fox Plaza in Los Angeles, but Nakatomi Plaza is this new building. It's been taken over by terrorists. Is anybody, anybody here from France or French Canadian? Now, there's a very, very funny French Canadian ripoff of this, but um, which is translated into English as "Don't die too hard," and it's, 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 it's very, fun. it's very amusing. But anyway, it, it gets taken over by terrorists, and Bruce Willis has to, 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 to save um, everybody in the building and, and all these things, and of course he does. And the problem with Nakatomi Plaza is it's beautifully architected. It has a sweeping grand staircase. It has you know, um, elevators, wonderful glass elevators and elevator shafts. It has corridors, it has glass offices, it has partitioned rooms, it has these wonderful kind of see-through glass offices where you can see the boss yelling at the secretary and things like that. It's all very, um, it's all very beautifully designed. Uh, but in parallel to the design of the architects is what one of my architect friends calls Nakatomi space. And Nakatomi space is what Bruce Willis uses. Because Bruce Willis doesn't walk up the grand sweeping staircase when he's chasing the terrorists. He doesn't go up in the elevator because they expect that. He uses the elevator shaft for climbing. He uses the air ducts for crawling. He sees a glass window, he smashes his way through it. He sees a glass office, he dives through the window and hides behind the partition. The corridors, if you never walk along a corridor because you expect him to walk along a corridor. He lives, he navigates through Nakatomi space. And Nakatomi space is this way of navigating through an architecture which is entirely parallel to the way that the architect intended it. And we in the IT world, we design data architectures and our users live in Nakatomi space. Our users navigate the system in a way that we never intended. Anybody here work for a public company? Publicly listed? Yeah, quite a few of you, okay. Um, so how are your sales this quarter? Are you gonna tell me? and give me your ticker while you're at it. No, you can't do that, can you? You're not allowed to tell me. You probably don't know yourself. You're not allowed to tell me what your, what your sales numbers are. And, um, and there's a reason for that because it's governed and compliant. You have to, you've got governance around insider trading. So you can't come up and tell me, yeah, we had a great blowout quarter because I've just about got time to go out and place some bets tomorrow on that. And that's highly regulated, it's highly restricted. If you work in a public company in an IT department, and I've done this in, in several public companies, there are all sorts of controls around who can access the data in the last few weeks of the quarter. You will start to lock down. Sales managers can see the numbers, and then it gets locked down so that other people can't. Then it gets locked down so that even the sales managers can't see it. It's just the finance guys who can see it. And as you get to that countdown in the last days of the quarter, Nobody can see the global total for the company except a very few people within the, um, within the finance department who are looking at those numbers and making sure that they, they're, they're correct for the end of the quarter. And so you have this whole system. And it's very, very strictly controlled and it's very tightly architected. Meanwhile, you can stand at the water cooler and tell me what the numbers are. That's Nakatomi space. There's nothing stopping you doing that. Well, there's laws stopping you doing that, but there's nothing stopping you doing that. If you're standing at the water cooler discussing this quarter's numbers with me, you are collaborating on data. It might not be controlled by SharePoint, it might not be controlled by Click, it might not be controlled by your you know, enterprise class encryption system, but you're sharing numbers with me. You're collaborating with me on data. And how do you govern that? Well, we govern it by discipline, we govern it by practice, we govern it by the HR department breathing down your neck, we govern it by monitoring and analyzing people's behavior, but we don't govern it by restricting access because we can't. You can't go put duct tape over everyone's mouth when it comes up to the end of the quarter. It doesn't work that way. And so, no matter what our data architecture is, there's other ways of navigating through it. And it's not necessarily got to do with hacks. I once worked at a, um, this a work at a brokerage on the East Coast and they were analyzing, this was the time of the kind of financial crisis in, in, in like 2003, 2004, uh, sorry, sorry, 2008, and they were analyzing um, the personal credit ratings of some of their key customers against 
the work that they were doing in the brokerage. So they were actually trying to work out how is this person's credit rating being affected by the financial crash and can we afford to make the trades that they're wanting to make. Very, very sensitive information. And that information was sitting there in a file which was in a folder called something, 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 slash, slash, server, slash, cappuccino. And that seemed a bit strange. And I asked the, uh, um, the person, the analyst who was doing the work, why is this folder called cappuccino? It seems kind of weird. And he says, oh, well, you know, we're not actually really supposed to have the data. And it was going to take us weeks to get access to it. But I got the database administrator, the mainframe administrator. She just gives me a dump of it as a CSV file. And every time she does that, I buy her a cappuccino. So I, the, <laughs> the folder reminds me that when there's a new file there, I've got to buy her a cappuccino. It's a governance system, highly governed system. But of course, it's governed by the fact that she trusts him. And he's a senior analyst, and he's not going to go out and do anything bad with this information. Try building that into an architecture. Try explaining that to the Securities and Exchange Commission when they come around. But actually, it's not badly governed. It's just a Nakatomi space that people are using to navigate a system in a way that the data architects didn't intend. So you'll gather from this that I am not keen on systems of governance that get in the way of business users doing their work. And the reason I'm not keen on that, the reason I don't believe it's desirable to lock down systems is because it's not possible to lock down systems. If you actually think you have locked down your system in a way that the business users can't collaborate, then you've never seen somebody use an iPhone to take a screenshot of data, scrape it using a, an OCR reader, and dump it into Excel. There is nothing you can do. I've seen companies which had USB ports, super glued shirt, and that's how people got the information. Take my iPhone, take a screen grab, there's the data. Can't stop people doing that. I'm not suggesting a free-for-all either, but I am suggesting that you have to be aware of these other systems. And once you're aware that people can crack your system almost any way, then suddenly you can relax a little bit more. It's kind of strange. The more insecure you are, the more relaxed you can be about it. <laughs> There's a strange thought, but it's kind of true. It's the thought that, you know, I don't have to try so hard to prevent people doing things. I have to monitor and analyze and understand what they're doing. That's the key to, to, to people being compliant. So the new model of governance that I have, and the one I'm going to suggest, is rather than thinking of a life cycle model where we are in control of all the requirements and actions that users can take, think of it more like a supply chain. And the supply chain that I like is the farm-to-table supply chain. Now, the farm-to-table supply chain we're kind of familiar with. There's a farm which grows ingredients. There's a processing of these ingredients. They're graded, they're cleaned, they're washed. There's a transportation of these ingredients, either to the supermarket or to the restaurant or to the, the wholesaler. They're then retailed, and then they're brought to the table. And you can eat them, and that's a very simple supply chain. It's a supply chain model I use to explain it because we're all very familiar with it. We get it. Now, there's a couple of things about the farm-to-table supply chain. Is it sounds very simple. You harvest things at the farm, you cook them, you serve them, and um, there's a certain amount of end-user work, um, which involves sharing and maybe seasoning or doing something like that to the food. But it's pretty straightforward. But actually, it's not straightforward. There are many ingredients in your, in your dish. If you're sitting and had lunch today, you know, there's probably eight or nine ingredients on your plate to make that meal. They all get harvested at different times. They all get harvested in different locations, perhaps from all over the world. They all have to be brought together, and in some way they have to be stored and managed in order to make that happen. And they all need different processing and different requirements. And so there's many, many different steps. Sure, there's harvesting. There's also cleaning and grading. There's processing of that food. Once the food's been cleaned, then other things may happen to it. Whole Foods Market, they'll clean your potatoes, and then they'll add new sterilized dirt to them to make them look more organic, and then sell it to you at a higher price, because they've done the extra work of putting sterilized dirt on there. And then they'll store them, and they'll store them in a way in, in air-conditioned or, or refrigerated facilities in order for them for, to be ready to be used. And then they'll be cooked, and then it'll be served. But they don't just serve food. Just serving food is, is, is not the end of the process. Actually, we have our own preparations that we do. We might buy these ingredients and prepare our own meals. We might season it. My son puts hot sauce on everything. That's his idea of improving the meal. 
and, um, but to him it is an improvement. So he has his own customization, if you like, that he does to it. And then there's sharing, sharing and collaboration of the dinner. And that itself is, is another form of adding value to it. If it's served family style or if you split it up into portions and things. So the supply chain isn't just a simple supply chain of there's a source and there's a destination. There's all sorts of things which happen in the middle. And even then, the end user, to use that terrible phrase, um, has work that they can do as well. And hopefully you now start to see a little bit of the parallel that comes into the data world. Because the data world isn't just a case of having sources and reports. People can take action on many of these things as they're working. We have sources. We have integration. We have cleaning, after all, and grading. We have storage. We have data warehouses, which the very name implies they're st the data is stored there in order to be ready for a future use. We have an analytics. We have visualization we can add. We have reports that come out. But even when you've got reports, you can do stuff. There are desktop sources you can bring in. I was suggesting you can go and use tools like Data Market and bring in weather data and demographic data. There's customizations you can make. There's collaboration. You can start to share this data. Not only in a technical way by putting it up on SharePoint or annotating it or putting it up on, uh, on a server in order to make that available, but there's informal collaboration. There is discussing it around the water cooler, which is a form of collaboration. And then finally, there's export to Excel. Um, Anthony Dayton, the CTO of Click, used to say that every time someone exports to Excel, an angel loses its wings. And, um, <laughs> You know, it's kind of true. Um, Rita Salam of Gartner once said that traditional reporting tools like business objects have become nothing more than the world's most expensive ETL tools for Excel users. Uh, the first thing you do when you want to do real work is you export to Excel and get on with it. Um, so all these systems, the carefully prepared bottom layer of this supply chain, if that was the way you governed, it would break down as soon as people started to do their own work on the top. But the way to think of this supply chain is actually to think of it more in the way that we think of other supply chains. Value is continually being added, and the IT department's job is to make the supply chain efficient, to make sure it runs well, but also to monitor it and analyze it and to understand what's happening. It's about insight and oversight rather than about control. And ironically, by giving up that control, you get more insight and oversight into what's happening. Because people are not, it's a bit like the world of, um, do you, anyone, anyone remember Napster? Uh, Napster, the MP3 sharing, yeah, I, I loved Napster. You know, when I was a kid, the way we shared music was we put a microphone in front of the radio, we recorded stuff onto tapes, and then we copied the tapes. We were not criminals. We weren't trying to defraud David Bowie of millions of dollars. We were just wanted to share his music because we loved his music. And then Napster came along, and you could kind of do that digitally, and it felt like you were doing the same thing. But the music industry hated it and said, oh, you're all criminals. All we're doing is just the same stuff as we did when we were 11 years old. At least that's what it felt like. And they, implied, they, they actually brought in new laws and regulations and governance around this. And this all got solved by a very, very simple method, which was when Apple created iTunes and for the iPod, things suddenly changed because now it was only 99 cents and it was cheap. And it was easy, and it was pleasant, it was great to use. And now you didn't have to go out and be a criminal because it was actually easy to be compliant. Make it easy to be compliant and people will be compliant. The people in your organization are not criminals. They're not out there trying to do bad things. They are not bad actors. Most of them probably, well, no, I'm not going to say anything about Bruce Willis. But they have no bad intentions. They just want to do their job. Of course, there are bad people. But you can't act like a police state as if everyone's an enemy just because there are some enemies, you act in a way that enables people to be part of the process of helping you to govern correctly. And so the supply chain model for me is a much better way of doing it. So what is the new role of IT? I want to suggest a new role of IT in a very, very simple way. First of all, stop thinking about end users. There are no end users. As you can see, they're not at the end of anything. They're not at the end of the, the technology program because they can just bring their own technologies that you've never heard of, certainly that you don't have in your business. They're not at the end of the data process because they can add their own data. They're not at the end of the collaboration process. They're certainly not at the end of the decision-making process because that's why they have the data in the first place. So they're not at the end of anything. 
when as you think of it, it's very patronizing. I'm the center of excellence and you're the end user. It's kind of, you know, you're kind of looking down on them. And it's not that way at all. They are powerful, not only empowered, but insightful people who are doing great work. And so the idea that they're at the end of a process which you, out of the goodness of your heart, have provisioned is simply not the case. So what I suggest is that IT move from being gatekeepers, the people who prevent bad things happening to the system, to being shopkeepers. Shopkeepers who make good data available, who provision apps and processes in order to encourage them to be used. And shopkeeping doesn't mean that there's no compliance or governance. I'm very carefully chosen the example here of a shopkeeper, and you might not see it on your, on your screen so clearly, but she's not just selling delicious Mar bar, Mars bars. She's also selling alcohol and tobacco, which are strictly governed pro products. They're governed both on the demand side and the supply side. Strictly governed in the sense that she's not allowed to sell them to people under 21 or under 18 in the UK. And strictly governed in the sense that she's highly responsible for taxes and accounting for every single one of these things that she sells. So there's, an, there's a strict system of governance here, but there's no control. She's there. Nobody's looking over her shoulder all the time, making sure that every single packet of cigarettes is, is monitored as it's being sold. Instead, what there is is a system of trust, which ends up being more compliant.